So our first speaker today um, is Ziad Asali, Asali, and who's the president and founder of the American Task Force in Palestine. And as many of you, I'm sure, know, this is the leading Palestinian advocacy NGO in Washington, D.C., um, which has dedicated the NGO to the creation of a Palestinian state along Israel. Um, Ziad and actually George's um, CVs are in the booklets that you have, so I'm not going to, in either case, get into much detail, but enough to know that Ziad has testified many times before congressional committees on Palestinian issues such as education, the peace process, and the Israeli military conflicts with Gaza. Um, George Bichadet is the Honorable Raymond L. Sullivan Professor of Law at UC Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco. So he's here from the West Coast and he's going back soon. Um, again, there's a lot more information about him in the booklets that you all have. Um, but important to say that George is a leading expert on international legal aspects of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Like the previous panel, they will each speak for 20 minutes, not one second more, but many seconds less if they want to. Um, and after that, we're going to open it up um, to a discussion like before. Before I give the mic to Zayed, I just want to remind everyone, please turn off your phones. Please, please turn off your phones. Turn them off so they don't ring and don't disturb our wonderful speakers. And with that note, Zayed, thank you. Thank you very much. and. Uh, Thank you to uh, Professor Feldman and the uh, colleagues who have invited us and organized this session. Our topic, of course, is the Palestinian-Israeli future. Allow me to start out by stating my own conclusions. At this point in time, there is no two-state solution or one-state solution nor any kind of solution. What we have is a Palestinian-Israeli status quo which has been sloping downwards for decades. Barring any intervention, the present trajectory will slide all the way till there is process and then no process and no solution. I'll briefly address the historical factors that have blocked both the one-state solution and the two-state solution. When the PLO was established in 1964, it called for a democratic state of Palestine for all people who lived in the historic land of Palestine. That was one-state solution. That goal survived the 1967 war, Black September, the 1973 war, Palestinian militant organized hegemony over Lebanon, PLO expulsion to Tunis, and its more its remote control over the Intifada. Harsh reality forced the PLO to accept a two-state solution when it proclaimed the Palestinian Declaration of Independence in Algeria in 1988. This acceptance of a two-state solution was the ultimate Palestinian concession after a series of setbacks. Nasser had officially accepted the Rogers Plan, which is a, based on a two-state solution in July of 1973. Those who call for one-state solution pay little heed to that history. Perhaps they think that Israel is weaker now than or that the Palestinians are stronger now than they were at that time. One state solution is unachievable without the consent of Israel. The one state solution sounds good in theory, gratifying like a pleasant dream. It comprises elements of justice, equality, universal values, and everlasting peace. It is, however, disconnected from the realities of power and disparities of knowledge, skills, and means. It is innocent of the experience of the need to 
overcome cultural, religious, educational, economic, and technological disparities. It flies in the face of the Palestinian and Israeli national narratives that their respective quests for their own states would normalize their relations with each other and with the people around them and the region and the world. The one-state solution is a Palestinian ab abdication of its political right as a people and a negation of the Jewish people's right to have their own state. Where do we go from here? Let us acknowledge forthrightly that there are many actors on all sides who benefit from the status quo. They have and will use any means to sustain it by pursuing the zero-sum game to the finish. Not a single final status issue has been resolved after decades of negotiations. In the meantime, Palestinian land available for a state shrinks relentlessly. This problem is not amenable to quick fixes. Palestinian president elected for a four-year term in 2005 is still sending, serving his 13th year in office. The Legislative Council elected in 2006 is split between the West Bank and Gaza. It has not convened for the past decade. The PA continues to be dependent on foreign aid with a dysfunctional underfunded bureaucracy whose best functional department is the security apparatus that coordinates with Israel and the US government. Health, education, energy, transportation, and legal systems are all underfunded and mismanaged. The economy is in shambles as is political freedom, freedom of the press, and cultural life. Israeli issued VIP cards define the Palestinian elite. The leaders make the annual trips to the UN that provide legitimating photos and fiery speeches that e express the obligatory Palestinian constants about Jerusalem, borders, refugees, and right of return. With perennial threats to dissolve itself or to withhold security cooperation with Israel, the donor community continues to fund the PA. Gaza under Hamas has been, an has been an independent polity for a decade. And it lives under siege, besieged. It scrambles for handouts from the donor community and it seeks it to own a who own to seek a piece of Palestine or the Palestinian issue. The minimum services that the, political, that the public expects from the Hamas, it doesn't get. Prospects for Palestinian-Palestinian reconciliation are conditioned upon the wishes of outside donors. Israel also is a divided polity. Its duly re-elected prime minister, who served for almost a decade, has steadily moved quickly to the right, moved policy to the right, away from compromises and turn towards settlement expansion, which no political force in Israel has been able to stop. It keeps a tight hold over the population of the Palestinians in the West Bank while outsourcing slices of security and civil management to the PA. Israel is a military powerhouse. It has never had a better economy while flourishing industry, trade, education, services, scientific and technological advances, social, cultural, and artistic boom with ever improving foreign relations. It recently expanded its regional relations while watching the Palestinian issue sink lower on the regional and international agenda. However, Israel has ethnic, religious, economic, and social issues. The, de the deviation 
of universal liberal Western, from deviation from universal liberal Western values of equality have adversely impacted its image. But these issues do not seem to have slowed down the country's drift to the right. Israelis are aware of the emergence of the Islamic movement among Arab Israelis, as they are of the opposing trend of a growing secular movement amongst them. Normalization is a two-way street. I want to repeat this. Normalization is a two-way street. There is nothing normal about living under occupation. Occupation touches and permeates all aspects of Palestinian public and private lives. It is the absence of elemental freedom. Palestinians are starving for normalization that they call an end to occupation. Israelis too seek normalization. It is a public need, a state need, a political and psychological need to live in security and safety, free of terror attacks and from the stigma of occupation, exclusion, and boycott. The two-state solution seems to offer all of that for both people who seek normalization. But policymakers, politicians, and scholars have failed for decades to come up with a workable alternative to the two-state solution. However, the obstacles in the, in the way of the two states are formidable and deeply entrenched. There is a built-in conviction amongst a segment of both people to explain their deep hostility to each other after a century of escalating violence over land and property. The conflict has metamorphosed into ethnic, religious, racial, and civilizational conflict. Each party fulfilled the worst expectations of the other. Some Jewish Israelis are convinced that a fundamental part of their animosity to, to the excuse me, a fundamental part of their enemy's violent hostility is an unavoidable consequence for something uniquely wrong with Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims. This attitude is mirrored by some Palestinians, Arabs, and Muslims who hold the pervasive idea that there is something inherently bad or malicious about Jews or Israelis that makes them oppressive, merciless, and expansionists. This essentialism overrides any other definition of the other. In short, both victimized people feel that their enemies are especially wicked because they victimize the victim. Such people have devalued and dehumanized the other and locked horns in a zero-sum fight to the finish. These kinds of perceptions of the real character of the other foreclose and block compromise. Public policy and public discourse impact and are greatly impacted by such views. Political careers and populist movements are built around them. Truth is, Israelis are divided as are the Palestinians. Any generalization about either people is to be viewed with great skepticism. The local fragment, fragmented and insulated pre-industrial Palestinian Middle Easterns were no match for Jewish European immigrants who were victims as well as beneficiaries of a far more advanced European civilization. In a total fight over a century, there has been a winner and a loser, but there is no peace. There are several issues worth noting about Israel of today. Israel is a military, industrial, economic, and technological powerhouse that competes in the upper tiers of the global arena. It has succeeded in creating a Western country in the Middle East. Israel is by and large a country of laws and institutions with a wide middle class and a population committed to the state and its defense. Under different circumstances, it could have been a model for other countries in the region to emulate. The present rising right-wing trend in Israel parallels a similar trend in the West in the U.S. among some American voters. On the other hand, 
there is a globalist shift in the youth of America, including many in academia, business, and the media. There is a strand in Israeli thinking that perceives Palestinians as fickle, unreliable, and incapable of being partners. Putting aside the merits of the essentialist concern, it, is, it reveals Israel's lack of confidence in the durability of any confidence, of any negotiated agreement. Obviously, there is a symmetrical Palestinian opposing view. These mindsets present a serious obstacle to reaching any agreement. Israel has managed to hold on to Palestinian Israeli land it occupied to Palestinian land it occupied in 1967. Generations of Palestinians were born and live under Israeli occupation. An Israeli debate about the future of the disadvantaged, undereducated, and unemployed Palestinian youth has not moved beyond security towards developing a long-term strategy. Secular socialist founders of Israel and religious extremists who led the settlement expansion after 1967-73 managed to coexist as they disagree. There is no Israeli consensus on demographics, citizenship, Jerusalem, or national borders, or the character and future of the state of Israel. All of that dims prospects of peace negotiations. The Arab Spring impacted both people and the region. A favorable wind now is blowing towards Israel from several Gulf and Arab countries with prospects of tectonic shifts that could collectively realign them against Iran. Some in Israel view this as an opportunity to achieve a solution to the Palestinian issue by a general regional reconciliation. Others view it as an opportunity for a regional reconciliation that marginalizes Palestine. There's a symmetrical and opposite split on the Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim side. It might be that Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa are more significant than Palestine. Other issues worth following on the Palestinian side. A narrative of victimization and injustice led to a series of setbacks and retreat. Nakba in 1948 and Naksa of 1967, not acknowledged as defeat, gave permanence to dependency. Being part of an Arab or Muslim nation was considered a shield and rescue that turned out after several wars to be neither. Palestinian self-determination, which became a meaningful concept only after 1967, can now be viewed in the context of a grossly asymmetrical power equation. Skeletal government services and a fauda political system have contributed to preclude meaningful negotiations. Remnants of the PLO and the PA serve an important function of keeping Palestine alive as a national rather than a refugee issue and keeping it by keeping the two-state solution viable. Current leadership lacks the political or moral authority to make compromises on the final status issue. And the Palestinian final status issues are labeled Palestinian constants, capital P, capital C. They are to be delivered by someone, the US, the international community, Arabs, Muslims, or a new enlightened Israeli government. Settlement building has ceaselessly swallowed up an ever-shrinking space for the future Palestinian state. Call for a one state indicates, in part at least, despair of the viability of a Swiss cheese state. The geographically and politically divided Palestinian polity includes an entity in Gaza run by Hamas. There are no clean hands on the issue of Gaza and none of its tunnels leads to a light at the end. The rest of the world, including the USA, Arabs and Muslims, are presently overwhelmed and preoccupied 
with complex issues. But despite all claims to the contrary, this conflict about the Holy Land will continue to get attention because of religion. So once again, where do we go from here? I'll be frank. Current regional and geographical realities could not be less conducive to a conflict resolution at this time. Neither party has the credibility or political will to resolve the final status issues. Therefore, we must reach for a more achievable and less ambitious goal. Absence of a negotiated conflict ending resolution does not mean ending negotiations. The opposite is true. The time has come to seek a policy focused on removing the impediments that made a deal impossible. This policy is not about an interim agreement or precluding any future options and it is time limited. Let us call it managing the transition phase, managing the transition phase. The two parties cannot do this by themselves, even if they wanted to. Only the US has what it takes to oversee this phase. Allied sponsors must insist on being part of this oversight system. Once the hard decision to postpone final status negotiations is made, all efforts must focus on managing the transition. This means that good governance must top the agenda. Beautifying the occupation is an odious concept, but providing safety and better living conditions across the board is an empowering, noble objective. The goal of this phase, good governance, is to implement rule of law, build accountable institutions and services, provide jobs, and expand the economy, and enhance trade cooperation and mobility. Palestinian empowerment is a prerequisite for future stability. With all due respect, donors and underwriters of this phase must insist that mechanisms are in place for the international community to oversee projects and progress. Managing the transition phase is meant to improve Packed Palestinian lives as well as, is, as Palestinian and Israeli politics. The single most effective weapon against terrorism is a good governance with a good education as top priority. Occupation is incompatible with long-term stability. The very word normalization is very reviled by many and it is actually uh, a way to give the Palestinians a chance to become better competitors for what is coming their way in the future. It is a way to end coercive arbitrary existence and to prepare this, their societies on so many levels to be in a position to compete with their neighbors. Finally, the Arab Spring has dramatically changed the region. Political terrorism will wreak more havoc before it is defeated. Conflicts and problems of all states in the region are interconnected because everyone plays in everybody's court. Past assumptions and policies should be re-examined. Strategic challenges, alliances, and solutions across the board can and do intersect, including Israel and Palestine. My time is up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the people joining us virtually as well. It's wonderful that you could be with us. Uh, thank you, Shai, Christina, all the organizers of this very well-conceived and very well-executed event. It's really marvelous to be here, and I've enjoyed the conversation so far. Uh, I hope that doesn't stop uh, as, I, as I begin my talk. <laughs> so, uh, I was invited to speak to you today about how I see the future of Israel-Palestine. What I want to do in my initial statement, that is before our question period, is to say a little bit about where I think we are now. And uh, with apologies, I caution you that my assessment is rather bleak. Thereafter, I want to speak about 
what I see as necessary from the Palestinian side to forge a better long-term future. And that is to recenter justice as the lodestar of our struggle. But as justice is a, an abstract term, I will then spend the remainder of my time trying to flesh out various dimensions of justice that are important to incorporate as we move forward. Now, as many of us relearned, perhaps, last fall with the election of Donald Trump as US president, prognostication is a dangerous art. Yet I can say with confidence, although sadness, that what we will see in Israel-Palestine over the coming decade at least, and probably another two to three after that, is more of the same with periodic bouts of sharpening conflict. There may be some negotiations in some form and at some point, although frankly, in the short term at least, even this is unlikely. There will be more lawn mowing in the Gaza Strip there will be more so-called lone wolf attacks and possibly more organized and larger scale Palestinian resistance of a variety of tactics, both violent and nonviolent. Israel will be increasingly isolated and reviled by the peoples of the world and calls for boycott, divestment and sanctions or BDS will gain ground and it is even possible that Israel will actually begin to feel their bite. Yet the impact of BDS fueled by civil societies will be offset by their government's pragmatic calculations of interests in continuing to deal with Israel in arms, in security technology, intelligence, and the like. The fact is, for better or for worse, like it or not, Israel has defeated the Palestinian drive for a state. Its words, the words of its politicians, are again coming into alignment with its actions over decades, exemplified in Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu's recent declaration that no settlements will be withdrawn. So the era of lip service to the two-state solution has now lapsed and this has also been consecrated recently by President Trump's casual acceptance of two states or one state, whatever the parties agree to. But to the yin of Israel's strategic victory over the Palestinian quest for statehood, there is a yang of equal or greater strategic failure. And that is Israel's failure to reduce the Palestinian people over which it rules by much greater numbers. Palestinians have surpassed or will soon surpass the Jewish population within the borders of former Mandate Palestine with additional millions residing within 100 miles. The Zionist colonial project simply unfolded too late to employ the tools of earlier conquerors. Democratic colonial societies have only flourished in places like here in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, where native peoples have been not just vanquished but substantially annihilated either militarily or by disease or both and other factors as well. So expulsion followed by exclusion of Palestinian refugees and perpetual military occupation for the people in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip only go so far as a means to ameliorate Israel's dilemma. Uh, Israel's inability to abate greater Palestinian numbers lies at the root of its illiber illiberal and ethno-nationalist drift that has become a dominant motif of Israeli social and political life since 1967, accelerating more recently, and reflected in ever more hawkish right-wing governments. Ironically, this is also, in a broad sense, the reason for the increasingly authoritarian features of the Palestinian Authority and Hamas's regime in the Gaza Strip. 
One of the way non-democratic colonial societies have attempted to manage large native populations is by farming out repression to native sub-rulers. Think of South Africa's Bantistans. Because these uh, native sub-rulers cannot possibly alter the unequal structures that characterize colonial societies to actually deliver what their constituents need and demand, they face constant challenge from domestic rivals and have no choice but to rule undemocratically. In the Palestinian Authority's case, increasingly as the promise of meaningful statehood evaporates into nothingness. For the internationally recognized Palestinian leadership, the quest for a state that began as a means to realize Palestinian rights has morphed into a quest for, the, for a state as an end in itself, virtually without regard to the nature of that state, nor its capacity to actually accomplish justice for Palestinians. Thus, the two Palestinian regimes seem more likely to serve as coffins for the burial of Palestinian rights than vessels for their fulfillment. I would call them two, two more Arab police states, except they only meet the police part of that model. Now, I again apologize for this exceedingly bleak uh, assessment but I have to call it as I see it. Is there an antidote to this dystopian present, particularly for Palestinians, who to date have suffered the brunt of these trends and will continue to do so? I believe there is, although unfortunately it is not quick acting. Instead, it will require years of concerted and persistent human effort. What Palestinians must do for our own sakes and for the sakes of those around us is to recenter justice as our guiding light and either rebuild within the framework of existing structures or build a new movement around that ultimate goal. The Palestinian opposition to Zionist colonization began as a struggle for justice, first and foremost against the forced displacement of Palestinians in favor of Jewish settlers and the de denial of the right to return that we call the Nakba. Understandably, the struggle has focused on righting the wrongs against the Palestinian people. But as Ziad noted, the Palestinians have also embraced at times broader goals, particularly in the PLO's early embrace of a democratic secular state in Palestine we upheld a vision of a progressive society in which all peoples could live in peace and security and prosperity under a regime of equal rights and mutual respect. That was the vision that in the early days of our movement galvanized support of millions throughout the world. But it is no longer 1970. The era and ethic of decolonization that prevailed then is in the past. While the nature of the polity that rules Israel-Palestine is, is subject to contestation, the permanence of a large Jewish community, a nation, is not. The world has changed in other ways. Therefore, what we now require is a more multifaceted conception of justice than we have fielded in the past. Call it a 21st century justice reboot. So here are seven facets or dimensions of justice that, to my mind, merit consideration. This list is provisional. It's not exhaustive. It's mine. There may be, uh, and, and they, they are sort of fielded for the purpose of discussion. The first is what I would call original justice. And by this, I mean that while a broader conception of justice is called for today than in the past, the original core rights of the Palestinian people remain the bedrock of a just resolution. It is the Palestinians who were first and foremost the primary victims of Zionism 
and whose rights remain in most urgent need of restoration. We would build on, not discard, earlier conceptions of justice. I underscore here that I mean the entire Palestinian people, including the majority who are refugees in the internal, in internal or external exile, and those who live as second-class citizens in Israel. Early on, Palestinians recognized that justice for us could not be injustice for others, but there is need for a more fully elaborate conception of what might be called protective justice. We would benefit, I believe, by a compassionate declaration along the lines of South Africa's Freedom Charter outlining how, how our conception of justice also includes Israeli Jews who will continue to inhabit Israel-Palestine in perpetuity and by right. Palestinians must ha might have preferred a different history, but facts are facts, and a national community has, has arisen in our homeland that cannot be justly uprooted. Whether the land is shared in one state, two, or two dozen, we need a vision of a future society that respects and strives for justice and equality for all. The more concrete we can be, the better. For example, this is just an example, about the status and rights of secondary occupants, Israeli Jews, for example, who currently inhabit for former Palestinian homes. We need to outline a process that treats, that, that balances Palestinian rights to their properties uh, and to return, and that treats Jews currently inhabiting those properties justly and with respect and dignity. We must also think beyond the binary of Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs, which flattens and masks diversity on both sides. There are many considerations here, but the salient one to me involves Mizrahi Jews, who I would count, you, you might and many would surely disagree with me, but I would count as Zionism's second major category of victims. From the destabilization of their communities in the Arab world that Zionism caused to the discrimination and racism those who have settled in Israel have faced from Jews of Ashkenazi descent, Mizrahi Jews have suffered in relative obscurity. Mending their wounds will be a complex challenge and in part implicates regional considerations, which I will return to shortly. South Africa provides us a model for thinking about other facets of justice as well, both positively and negatively. South Africa conducted a partially successful experiment in what is sometimes called transitional justice. So while a transition for us still lies far ahead, we can start conceptualizing how we will do deal with truth and reconciliation. There is scope for acknowledgments and apologies for suffering inflicted on multiple sides, including by Palestinians. Post-apartheid South Africa, as you doubtless know, is riven with problems of crime and deep social and economic inequalities. Many critics of the transition from apartheid uh, trace these problems to the failure at the time of transition to consider questions of social justice. Israel suffers acute income inequality as became vividly apparent in the protest movement in Tel Aviv in 2011. The neoliberal policies of the Palestinian Authority have also exacerbated deep class divisions in the West Bank. Poverty rates in the Gaza Strip are terrible due to the ruinous siege now uh, heading into its 11th year and three major Israeli attacks and nearly continuous low-grade violence. Out of this, how do we not just end the Nakba, but also build a humane society in which any of us would be proud to live? Gender and sexual preference justice. Both Israeli and Palestinian societies manifest patriarchy and sexual preference oppression in their specific ways. 
on the Palestinian side, for example, women have long been expected to subordinate gender rights to the national struggle for no good reason. We must stand for gender and sexual preference justice everywhere and now, not in some mythical future. In a place where injustices against humans abound, it is easy to neglect damages to the natural environment. But we must account at some level for environmental justice. Israel has alternately plundered the occupied territories of water, uh, stone, and other resources, and used them as dumping grounds for pollutants. Neither has the Palestinian Authority proved itself a responsible steward of the environment. Yet justice to the land, if we may call it that, is a matter of urgent concern to all in the region. Now, you thought you weren't going to get another reference to Game of Thrones uh, today, but uh, I will say, while winter is not coming to Israel-Palestine, summer assuredly is. I refer here to climate, uh, studies by climatologists that global warming will result in coming decades to temperature rises in the Middle East that will challenge human survival. Indeed, in the Syrian civil war, which was preceded by several consecutive years of drought, we may have witnessed the first major conflict triggered, if not instigated, by climate change. Now, we can face this joint threat as squabbling tribes with ever more brutal consequences for the less powerful, or we can face it united in our humanity. This brings us to the last facet of justice that I will address today, namely regional justice. Israel has inflicted harm in varying degrees on all of its neighbors at one time or another. Just to start, Israel cast hundreds of thousands of destitute refugees onto neighbors ill-equipped to absorb them. Arab societies were disfigured, robbed of vitality and diversity by the loss of their Jewish communities following Israel's establishment. And while the circumstances of the departures of, of Mizrahi Jews from Arab countries varied widely, there is no doubt that some suffered grave injustices that should be acknowledged and rectified. Now, there are no doubt other dimensions to justice that could be added to this list. All I really mean here to do is, as I said, to initiate discussion. Why is recentering justice as our end goal a prescription, especially as we witness Israel's colonizing juggernaut grinding slowly but inexorably forward with absolutely nothing on the horizon to thwart its advance? Does it make sense to double down on justice and even expand our ambitions when we have failed to achieve justice in even a minimal form? Is it right to affirm tolerance and inclusion against the headwind, headwind of rising right-wing ethnic nationalism in which Israel is ahead of the global curve by a decade or two? Well, let's be frank. This is a big lift. There is no guarantee of success. And it is dispiriting for Palestinians to face the bitter fact that we are returning virtually to square one. It is, however, I believe, our best shot for a humane future for ourselves and for our neighbors. And never underestimate the power of ideas, of a cause, to motivate people to make heroic sacrifices. That really is how history is made. And that is the history that we must make. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, so to complete the Game of Thrones trifecta, I'm going to moderate the panel from the Iron Throne, on which I sit. Um, for those of you who are joining us who were not with us in the morning, we're going to have the same format, which is that 
We're going to take three questions, one from the University of Arizona in Tucson, one from the Fletcher School at Tufts, and then one from here at Brandeis, and then we're going to hand it over to our panelists to answer, and then we'll do as many of these rounds as we can. With the Brandeis crowd, we will give preference to the students, and um, I know I don't need to remind everyone of this, but a question is something that is not your opinion, but it's actually a question that you want to ask. So please, if you have a comment or you want to express your opinion, because I know the topic they spoke on is not controversial at all, and you know nobody really has an opinion on this. But if you do, please have it for after um, the panel or the coffee break and ask a question, because we have an opportunity to do that here, and we should really take um, we should take that opportunity and do it right. So on that note, the gods of University of Arizona. Good afternoon. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. My name is Ed Wright. I'm the director of the Center for Genetic Studies at the University of Arizona. Hopefully my voice is coming through a little clearer here. I have a, a ability to project maybe that others might not. So I'm going to read questions that have been submitted to me during the uh, lectures. The first question, Professor Bashara, who is, to, who is the we to which you refer that can lead the efforts on both sides of the conflict to move toward peace or at least a more effective peace process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tufts? Do we have a question from Tufts? Um, not at the moment, no. <laughs> All right, that means Tufts generously gives its question to Brandeis. Um, please raise your hand if you have questions, and somebody will come to you with a microphone. Before I go to anyone else, are any, do any students have a question first? Yes. Um, I saw the first, both of you can ask questions, and then we'll go. Um, hi, um, I'm Yenny, and um, I'm not a student here anymore, but I just graduated in May. Um, I was a research assistant in Professor um, Yuta Clausen's uh, research lab, which is called Western Jihadist Project. Um, I would like, since you, you, both of you have mentioned um, about the influence of terrorist group to the Palestinian development, and I'm wondering if you guys go in, can go into more specific and how these um, terrorist groups in the peripheral region can play a role into the future development of Palestine and in the social level, let's say. Um, ha has the Palestinian Authority done any um, programs or policies to help these um, youth in Palestinian youth um, that who's lacking the equal e education and employment opportunity as the Israeli youth. Um, anything will help. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, what is your prevalent? What, what do you think is a prevalent um, vision for for the state of pra uh, of Palestine or? Sorry, let me say it again. What is your vision for the future of the state of Palestine? See, since it was towards no, you do you both want to answer? I can reread the questions to you. Yes, please. Um, so the first question was actually for George, which is who is the we who can lead the efforts towards this um, peace, but probably towards this notion of justice that you laid out. Mm -hmm. And then for both of you, and maybe Ziad can answer the second question in particular, how can, how do these terrorist groups that you talked on the margins, um, what kind of role are they playing in preventing or solving? Um, is, that, is that a correct, Jenny? Is that, is that a good representation of your question? What role are these um, peripheral terrorist groups playing in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? 
And if it's a question of, if terrorism is a question of education or lack of opportunity, how is solving that issue going to affect um, the larger peace process? And then for both of you, what is your visions of a future Palestinian state? So George, you wanna start? So this sure. Is the first question. So uh, the, the first question was about who, who would lead this. Uh, I have to be candid that uh, I'm not expecting productive negotiations uh, or discussions to come, uh, come along any time in the coming decade or perhaps even two decades or three decades. And what I'm really talking about now is just the, the, the emergence of a discussion uh, in, in which uh, my voice is one. Um, I don't think I'm totally alone. I think that there is a constituency of other Palestinians, uh, intellectuals and others, maybe primarily based but not exclusively ba based in the diaspora, um, who, you know, who see things uh, in terms at least similar to mine. But we are at a very early stage, and I'm not prepared at this point uh, to identify any particular person or organization. All I can say really is that there are stirrings within the Palestinian diaspora community in particular uh, toward, the, the, toward the convening of um, new fora. I, I don't think it's even appropriate yet to call them organizations, but fora for discussion. Um, and and so uh, uh, we, are, we are necessarily looking far into the future, at least a couple of decades, uh, before I think anything um, uh, productive can, can happen. And I think that, you know, it is, that, that is a reflection of the, of the great imbalance of power, the asymmetry of power between Israel on the one hand and Palestinians on the other, and the fact that Israel, to this point, I don't think has reached the limit of its territorial ambitions um, and therefore will continue to slowly colonize more and more of the West Bank and there's not really anything, no power on the horizon, internal, external, international, that will alter that dynamic. It's been going on for, you know, since, since it's been going on for a century but it hasn't changed, it's only morphed in form uh, since, you know, since, since the Oslo era. Um, so, uh, so, I'm sorry to disappoint you if I'm not if I'm not giving you a uh, you know an identity or a, a specific name or group. Um, those people and those groups are going to have to emerge over time. And does this reflect your vision of a future Palestinian state uh, in terms of decentralization? Or I mean, what is your vision of future Palestinian? Well, state? you know, I I I've publicly supported a one-state solution for uh, for a very long time, but uh, it, and I've done that. Uh, if anyone cares to look up my article called Maximizing Rights, um, it's because I think that's the, that's the solution that holds the most promise of justice for most people. Never going to achieve complete justice for everybody. Um, that would require turning back the hands of time and that can't be done. Uh, but, uh, but I do think that that is for a variety of reasons what, what holds the most promise. But I'm not a dogmatist. Um, in fact, I was not hostile in the early years of, of the Oslo period. I was prepared to, you know, see, give it a try, see what would happen. I even did some consulting with the Palestinian Legislative Council on uh, drafting a number of their laws, and I could see that there were a lot of very well-intentioned and very capable people uh, sort of on the ground level who were doing really hard and really important work to try to make things work, um, and, and, uh, and, and they didn't. Um, so I, I'm not, like I said, a, a dogmatic, and, but, but what I accept, I guess, about the principle that justice is the guiding light, it's the lodestar. So what arrangement, what configuration of power, what set of principles uh, can, we, you know, can, we, can we apply that does the most for the most? You know, I don't really see a substitute for equal rights, <coughs> excuse me, equal rights, um, and, and, and fundamental equality. Um, those are the conditions in which peace can, real peace, durable peace can really flourish because the sense of, of injustice, the sense of inequality, the sense of oppression goes away when you have, you know, when you have a system that treats people fairly. Um, but I'm, I'm open-minded and, and I'm willing to, uh, 
entertain you know it, uh, proposals that that are you know that are that are that spring from more creative minds than mine. Speaking of which, yeah, do you want to start with the, your vision of I, the past? I, I want to hand, uh, yeah. handle both, if I may. First off, uh, I agree with Hassan that there is no real prospect of, of George. That's right. <laughs> that you is, can call that's me your cousin. You can call me Hassan. It's all right. I, I don't mind Hassan. Uh, I can run with that. What, uh, what, uh, there is no real prospect of a negotiated solution of any serious effort that will end up delivering some document that anybody will celebrate. Not with the present fragmentation of polities, both in Israel and in Palestine, and the lack of the global will to get engaged with this level at this issue at this time. So, so that is why, you know, the, the, the issue that really needs to be dealt with to fill the time between now and then. What do we do? Waiting for things to germinate, talk about justice, talk about you know, the, the possibility of some kumbaya between some Palestinians and Israelis, or, or do we do something on the ground that changes facts on the ground, realities on the ground, in a way that makes it possible for people to negotiate seriously down the road and to find and explore ways along with what uh, uh, Abdel Minam Said said earlier today, th there is some kind of an organic relation. How do we develop it? How do we develop it within the entity that's still not Palestine and with the relations with the Israelis? These are the problems of the day. Talking about justice is fine. I mean, who is, who is against justice? Raise your hands if you're against justice. Uh, but justice hasn't served the American Indians very well. And we need to keep that in mind. It is essential to keep justice as a guide when you craft laws and treaties and relations, etc., etc. And that is, and, and, and also when you motivate people politically in order to achieve something or to sacrifice, it's good to invoke it. But if you take it seriously as a vague, a vague abstraction that will guide you to your, your uh, uh, objective, your goals, you would be missing some element that's very important, which is reality on the ground. And I think uh, talking about, uh, let me just contrast two, two things. I am a Palestinian. I, in fact, I'm a refugee and an immigrant. So I have all the credentials. The, to, 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 to have a situation where the issue of uh, justice becomes a distraction from what you need to do because you want to be consistent with some kind of an ideal uh, is uh, depriving yourself from a weapon when you enter into a, into a confrontation or a big confrontation. So what happens on the ground with the pioneers of Israel, who came immigrants, penniless, shoeless sometimes, and completely uh, left without options. They established the kibbutz. The Palestinians, when, when they were hit by the Nakba, ran away in the same condition, and refugee camps were set up for them. What the Palestinian, what the Israelis did with the kibbutz is built within the kibbutz which eventually came to be the state of Israel. What the refugees left in camps with really with few resources to, to build on and with no meaningful assistance and then to keep them alive, ended up with where we ended up with. So the onus in my view on this situation is on the Palestinians. You know, enough waiting for the U.S. to solve it, or the Arabs to come and you know save the day, or the Islamists, and any, anybody, somebody in in Spain says something, and you know, will he be our leader? There is an absolute must for the Palestinians to take charge and do something for themselves. The beginning place is, of course, in the West Bank right now. So it's just there. Uh, that is one reason why. Uh, and uh, Abdul Minam again mentioned Salam Fayyad. Well, there was an experiment, a serious experiment, politically viable in Palestine 
to build in, in the infrastructure of an institutional you know, entity that will become a state. So that eventually you go to the rest of the world and say, see, I have everything. How come I don't have a state? Here's what happened. The world showered compliments and accolades on Fayyad and gave him no political or financial support. So there is an element here that's to be kept in mind. Somebody's kidding somebody. There has to be a higher level of, of, of integrity in the conversation amongst everybody. Okay. Justice is a variable. Justice does not mean nothing. Justice means something. But anybody, anybody who thinks that justice itself will get you somewhere is, is banking on the goodwill of a fickle world. All right. What needs to be done is to, is to build the infrastructure, what I today call uh, to use the interim period in order to do something with it. But this cannot be a Palestinian project alone. The Palestinians don't have the tools. All you have to get out of them is leadership that's worth something. Leadership that is not corrupt or selling out or whatever. Normal leadership, so to speak. Competent leadership. But, they, but you cannot build on that alone, e if, even if you have, because you're under occupation. Occupation is not just a picnic. Occupation does not let you move from your home to your grandmother's home in, in another village. So there is a limit on what, what they can do. So if you are to move the ball forward on this project, you do need the cooperation of Israel. The enlightened Israel that sees that okay, we really have to think strategically. What do we do with 50% of the population? We need to find a way to live with it. So instead of making up your mind about the end destination, you make up uh, your mind about how do we improve things to get there, to get there. We do have a prototype in what Fayyad did, but it, it has to be policy, not just policy of the Palestinians or the Israelis. It has to be policy of the international community, right. without which there would be no movement forward. Zaid, I just want to stop for a second, and because and, I'm breaking with protocol, so my head will be on a pike very soon. But I just feel it's actually important to let George address the justice issue, because to my untrained ears, you're talking about two different kinds of justice. And I feel you're in conversation with your ordinary justice, the first point that you raise. So is that, I mean, do you want to just I very briefly address sure. the question yeah, of justice I, I, here? I think that's fair. and. Uh, what I actually said was that justice would be the lodestar and that it would take a lot of human effort uh, and, and persistence. So um, I, I was not outlining a program uh, and I, I do not expect, you know, I don't believe that justice is self-executing. It doesn't come about because we sit around waiting for it. It comes about because we take deliberate actions in support of it. Um, and I think we could, we could have a very long discussion about what those steps might be. But it's a different program than, um, than, uh, than you know, sort of waiting for the right alignment of, of outside forces that will enable you know, successful negotiations. The, the problem, I think, is, you know, Ziad, and where I differ with your analysis, is that um, you don't account for the failures of the past, really, when you say, for example, that, um, that uh, you know, uh, uh, Fayyad lacked international support. Well, why did he lack international support? Why didn't that, why didn't that happen? The, f the fact is, I think if you just sort of step back from the situation and, and, and look at it from, a, from, a, from you know, the 35,000 feet, the, 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 the pieces are not there. And they are, they're not going to be there. There is not going to be any alignment of forces any time in the near future that you can identify that will change the, f the fundamental dynamic. And the, the dynamic is it's just not worth it for most people to confront Israel over, yes, sir. Yeah. You know, over these things. And so it's, it's going to, by the time we're talking again about these, it's going to be 800,000 settlers in, in, we don't you know, in the we West don't, Bank. We don't disagree on that part. Yeah. I, I, the, the title of my speech is Managing the Transition. I am aware, completely aware, and I think probably 90% yeah. of the people in this room and who are listening understand that there is no solution coming up anytime soon. Right. So we need to manage this, whatever it is coming down. We do not need to wait for it to happen. Sure. We do not need, for instance, in, 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 in under the Palestinians where the problem percolates, sure where there is a need for education and health, etc., etc. So we do not produce terrorists going back to the 
to the uh, question, you know, there, there's a factory of producing terrorists, which is just terrible uh, living conditions with no hope and no jobs, etc., etc., and a leadership who is just doing very well, thank you. So there is a need to change that. That has to be part of an international policy, I have to say, an international policy that has to merge. To, to, to merge. Uh, and I have this great suggestion for the present leadership in this country, which is you're formulating policy, good. Regional policy, great fit in something that does not force you for the next four years of your existence to make decisions and offend anybody. Just improve the situation on the ground by consensus amongst the Palestinians and the Israelis that the United States has to be the indispensable partner of the effort. Great. Um, Arizona wait, University. Wait, do you uh, want to add? He, he, had, he addressed it, but do you want to okay. say more about it? He linked it to the Palestinians. But do you want to say more about the terrorists? Whether the question bad. of education and they're, and they're pretty bad. Did you did you feel like your <laughs> question Let's not was make answered? More of them. Was your question answered? Okay. They they you could okay as yes, others yes, have uh, hold a veto <laughs> power over progress. All right, great. So let's not forget I'm the queen here. So University of Arizona, Tucson. <laughs> The, the next question. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Please. Asali, I, I think it yes, follows sir. on our discussion uh, just now. I think it uh, dovetails nicely. Dr. Asali, yes, sir. mentioned corruption and mismanagement in the PA. Given that reality, what individuals or mechanisms may Palestinians and foreign investors trust to make economic success possible in Palestine? Okay. Uh, one second. Let's get another question from yes, Tuck. Yes, please. Uh, Tuck? Yes. Please? Hello. Uh, we actually don't have one question from Tufts. We have three, but one of them is from Wait. Karim Al Qadi, who gives you all his regards. Hi, we are Karim. very happy to have hijacked him from Brandeis. So he's given his slot to the other two students. So please go ahead. You briefly discussed the threats of uh, climate change on the region and the conflict. Um, however, could you elaborate how, if there are any opportunities for the two sides to cooperate on these issues? Okay, thank you. And we'll take uh, one. Yes, and for the second question, uh, you mentioned that this is also on the Palestinians and that the Hamas Fatah split. Um, there's no end in sight to that either, let alone uh, negotiations for a final status agreement. So my question is, in the interim, um, do you think the quartet can change its demands of Hamas in order to push the parties closer together for a legitimate unity government and maybe get the ball rolling on that? Did you guys get the question? I didn't hear Can you repeat your question, it, the, the ending of your question? Tufts, can you just repeat the end of the question, please? Whether the, you guys suggest that the quartet can maybe change their demands of Hamas uh, in terms of you know, giving up violence or, or uh, just a new approach, something different that hasn't happened in the past 10 years in order to push them closer uh, to negotiating on a more level playing field with Fatah and maybe you know, the Palestinians might be more united than in the past 10 years. Thank you. Can we get a quick question from Brandeis? Thank you. Both panelists decried the right-wing nature of the Israeli government, um, and that is being seen as a, uh, an impediment to peace. But my question is, where was the Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian people, back in Camp David, back in 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when offers were made to give up 99% of the land and allow a Palestinian state to come into being? Why was that not accepted? And just looking at the nature of the, of the Israeli polity, isn't it true that whenever a, an Arab leader comes out and extends a hand for peace, that all of a sudden the shift goes from right to left? Thank you. Do you, do you both know the questions, or do you want me to repeat them? Uh, if, you, if you don't mind. All right, I'll just do it quickly. Yeah. So the first question is for Ziad, which is, 
Um, what are the factors that will let Palestinians succeed considering the corruption and mismanagement in the PA that you had mentioned? Um, for George, in terms of climate change, environmental justice, actually does that create opportunities for cooperation between the Palestinians and Israelis um, in addressing it? The third question is to both of you, I think, which is that if the quartet changes its demands of Hamas, would that actually change um, the factors on the ground in trying to think about a solution? And the last question, whoever wants to take it, which is that you both talked about the right-wing nature of the current Israeli government, but in the past, when offers were made to the Palestinians and rejected by the Palestinians, that was not the nature of the Israeli state. And so, so that can't be an essential factor, I'm assuming is the question, in, in why we are where we are today. Um, so we started with George before, last time, we'll scope as yet. Please. Management. Uh, and it is tied in with the question of missed opportunities. There are many missed opportunities, not just the one that was asked about. Uh, it is related to the quality of leadership issue. So, uh, you know, after, after a series of uh, problematic management that did not help improve the lot of the Palestinians who started at a very low point, you start you know, raising questions about the, the structure that you're dealing with. Uh, you know, if, if, if your qualifications to become a minister is that you had spent 17 years in Israeli jails, and uh, that qualifies you for some kind of a high place to be placed, uh, it's not good enough. And that cannot be good enough at any point in the future. You expect the issue to be resolved beyond the confines of Palestine, simply stated. I do not have to mince any words. What I'm talking about when we say do not give up on negotiations, just because negotiations failed for the last uh, two, three decades, doesn't mean that you give up on negotiations. It means you change what you negotiate about. And that is what I call managing the transition. You negotiate with your adversaries and with the international sponsors, i.e. the United States, the Europeans, and others, and Arab leaders, jointly to answer the, the question of managing the transition. Top of the list, the subject of the conversation is good governance. That is an issue to be negotiated. So that when you end up with whatever agreement that you know, the people in that position, you know that you have introduced an element of accountability that had not existed, oversight, that had not existed up till now. This is crucial. This applies to you know, who do you hire as a, as a janitor somewhere, and, or to you know, you build an industry, all of that, and managing cabinet. There is an a need for people who will pay for this. If you have a shop and you hire a manager, you pay him. You pay him to do something. What, the, what, what you will do is for the new management, so to speak, to be accountable to you to provide good governance. That means accounting across the board. So that minimizes the issue of the person, personalities of now, and, but it maximizes the system part of it, which would absolutely have to be a, 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 an international uh, system that includes the neighborhood. Uh, is that enough about this issue? Yeah, if okay. you feel that's enough. George, do okay. you want to do, pick up the climate? Yeah. So, um, you know, I would, so there, there's, there's, as far as I know at the moment, there's little to no coordination between Israelis and Palestinians over, over issues of, of climate and environment. Sadly, there should be, because there's a great deal of uh, common interest in, you know, in managing scarce resources in a, in, a, in a fair and intelligent and sustainable way. Um, I, I uh, you know, uh, I, the, the, I think there is greater awareness and development uh, on, on the Israeli side, although it tends to not really extend to environmental impacts outside of Israel itself. I know that, for example, that the, the root of the wall, which has 
pretty, pretty bad environmental consequences generally has been altered in a few places to preserve some irises, you know, a, 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 an endangered spe species of iris, and there are some small openings in the wall that, are, that permit wildlife to pass, to pass back and forth. Um, you know, Palestinians look at this and say, you know, irises are more important than we are um, in, you know, in Israeli uh, environmental planning and figuring. Um, but as I said, you know, uh, the challenge is, is acute already. Uh, there are many experts who say that Gaza will be uninhabitable by the year 2020, which is, as we all know, three years from now. You know, water is uh, mostly impotable by international standards already. Um, and uh, so there, there are great challenges and great threats. And if we are not now concerned with it, we ought to be. So there is, um, there, there is, there is the possibility, the potential uh, not yet the actuality of, of cooperation in this field. Leah, do you want to pick up the question of whether the quartet, if the quartet changes its demands of Hamas, that could be an opening, which yeah. it actually links to the Gaza environmental catastrophe mm -hmm. in some way? Uh, I, I want to be very honest here. I don't see a way out for Gaza anytime in the near future with Hamas or not Hamas. I don't see any way to nudge Hamas out, and I don't see anybody wanting to take over Hamas, to, to take over Gaza. Uh, so the question of make, making the life of the people of Gaza better would be the highest aspiration that you could have for the near future. There is an incompatibility in the future, uh, the Palestinian future, between a, something like Hamas, if fundamentally religiously driven armed polity to coexist with a civil society which it has its own you know, mundane rules of running things. Uh, that was part of the problem. It will continue to be part. The one figure that, that just struck me yesterday as I read out of one of the surveys coming out of the West Bank is 96% of the Palestinians are religious, or religion mm -hmm. is very important to them. That's a high percentage. People can look at this number any way they want, but it is something if I were in business and have some 96% customers, I want to part of that. Okay, so it is, you know, excluding religion uh, completely just because political Islam has been murderous and terroristic and etc. etc. does not mean that you have abandoned the field of religion to those guys. It's, it's within this light that I see the future of Hamas or maybe a split or whatever. Did you feel your question was answered or? Uh, do either one of you want to address the question of whether the nature of the Israeli state or the government today, the fact that it's a right-wing government, mm -hmm. is really a factor when you look at it historically and you say there were other yes. Israeli governments and we still didn't have a solution. Yes, yes. the answer is yes. There is, a, there is a problem with the decision making in Palestine over the past several decades where, you know, the, after the 67 war, Israel was ready to sign a deal on a two-state solution, you know, pretty much every labor-led uh, government was ready to make a deal. Uh, you know, they were always quibbling on the margins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, actions coming out from Palestine at the side, let's say, politically did not help in in empowering that part of Israeli politics, and that help the, the rejectionists on the Israeli side. And they feed off of each other, as far as I'm concerned. Extremists do. Now, now it's nice. It's, it's, there is no symmetry. There is much more kind of uh, entrenchment of the right wing in Israeli politics. So this, it's not a marginal thing anymore. Uh, the damage has been done. And I think uh, we have to find ways to deal with it. That's one of the reasons that I think uh, this business of a one-state solution, with all due respect, it sounds good. It's just like, you know, uh, fine. Everybody will love each other and will have the same laws. It's not going to happen because there's a lot, of, a lot of hatred, a lot of racism, a lot of bias, a lot of 
uh, unsatisfied needs on both sides that make it difficult. It would have been easier in the days of probably Sharon and then easier at Almert than it is now. Uh, we cannot redress history, but we can manage the transition. George, do you want to add to that? Well, um, I actually didn't, didn't uh, cite the right wing trend in Israel as a reason for the, uh, you know, for, for the impasse. Um, what I did was to link it to the challenge of governing uh, a lot of Palestinians um, and to, to explain its emergence and, and you know, the illiberal, the anti-democratic, the, um, you know, the ethno-nationalist trend in Israel as a, as a response to this, to this situation in which you know, it, it, it attempts to repress and control and it encounters resistance and it hardens and, and you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. That, that's actually the, the, the context in which I cited it. Although I would concur with Yad that, that, that uh, although, you know, what you said isn't what I said, I actually do think it is a factor um, and I think it complicates and makes much more difficult a resolution anytime in the short term. It's one of my, you know, one of my, one of my reasons for not having any uh, expectations in the near future. I would say this of, of you know, of it in, in, you know, in defense or at least to, you know, something that can be said for the right wing, Israel's right wing is that it's more candid in a lot of ways than, um, than the so-called Israel left. Uh, and it's, it's open about its intentions, and um, more open at least, uh, and um, I suppose there's something positive to be said for that. All right, can we go back to Tucson, please? This is the last round of questions. So. Thank you. Uh, to Dr. Asali, what do you mean by zero sum in terms of international engagement when Israel is successful in international trade and the Palestinians are successful in international donor support. It does not seem to be an issue of a single pie being divided. Thank you. Did you get it? Yeah, I don't like the trade off. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we go to Tufts, please? Uh, hi, thank you. Um, so we, we were discussing a lot about this expansive justice that surpasses the binary. So my question is, um, what do you see as Zionism's role in this kind of expansive justice, uh, if any at all? Thank you. And then the last question at Brandeis, there's a student in the back. Go ahead. Um, there are certain places in the West Bank that have had a continuous Jewish population for thousands of years as well as like real historical and religious importance for the Jewish people. So I'm just wondering, like an example would be Hebron, I'm just wondering um, whether or not you see like in a future Palestinian state a possibility for Jewish presence in those places. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so let's go with George first on the question of would you see Zionism's role in expansive justice and then we'll go to the question of the zero sum and maybe both of you can talk about the continuous Jewish presence. In, sure. um, so uh, I have to confess that I'm not a fan of any nationalism really to be honest with you and, uh, and, and Zionism at least political Zionism uh, is, is a form of nationalism um, and Therefore, I'm not, I'm not much of a fan. But I also sort of, you know, I'm a, I'm a live and let live kind of person. And if it, you know, it, if, it, if it floats other people's boats, I don't mind until it starts impinging on my interests and my rights. Um, I would want to envision a, a, a situation in which Zionism, uh, you call it, you know, uh, cultural form of Zionism, or uh, at least a, 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 an inclusive and, uh, and non-supremacist form of Zionism, ahlan wa sahlan. I've got no, you know, no uh, issue with that. Um, again, as long as Zionism is, is expressed in a way that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that does not impinge on the rights of others. Yeah. 
Let me address this for a second. Okay, but we have four minutes left four for minutes. all the questions. Well, well the initial Zionists were secular people, were socialists, were anything other than the, the image of the new Zionists are now uh, in, 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 at least in the media and the press and in, in politics. So it is, it is beyond nationalism, you know, this issue of uh, what Zionists are. We, we, we have to be serious when we get engaged in such uh, conversations. Zionism is out there in Israel, supported by the majority of the people who keep uh, electing one Zionist after the other, whether labor or, 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 or Likud or anything in between, and we have to deal with that fact. It is Israel's business, basically. And I think this is something we must understand on the, on the, on the Palestinian side. This is uh, as foolish to get involved with that as it is to say that no, no, not six, six million uh, uh, Jews died in Europe, it was only one million. And besides, you know, they falsified the story and, you know, Israel was cooperating. But what, you know, this is, you know, this is added burdens that one should, should not assume. I think this is important to, to live with and live by. You do not expect the Palestinians to, to go around getting you know, everybody's approval of their wanting to have a, a state or approve their nationalist aspirations or anything. And the same is true of everybody else. Now, on the issue of uh, zero sum, zero sum, look, what is bad is what got us where we are. What is worse is that it will get worse if we don't stop it. So the zero sum game that you're referring to is, is, uh, is, is bad because it got us where we are and it's gonna get worse if we don't stop it. That's why we need to intervene. There is a need for an intervention. The fact that the Palestinians got money from Europe, what did the money do? Kept them alive under occupation and added to the Swiss bank accounts for some of them. Okay, that is not exactly our aspiration for the future. And that's not what the money, the, the, if that is the positive side for the Palestinians, then we're in for a really bad future. So there has to be some purpose to every effort from now on at least to aim for a better resolution. That better resolution could be any variation of two states or one state, as far as I'm concerned. As far as I'm really concerned, the exciting things are happening in the region, and not on Palestine, Israel. And if we, that's why this managing the transition fits in on regional aspirations, security deals regionally, etc. But I don't wanna, you know, you have limited time. Yeah. So I the Jews in Palestine, let me jump into that right away. Of course they should be able to live in Palestine, of course. You know, there, there should be no serious question about that. And if you, have, if you want more of an answer, you can come after our time is up. Um, I want to thank our partners in Arizona and at Tufts for very efficient question asking, and of course, all of you. But most importantly, I want to thank our wonderful guests for a very, very interesting conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.